Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen to this month's non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday the 4th of May um, and just let's get some housekeeping out of the way first just get the disclaimers up and uh, up and running so basically us usual rules apply nothing new here um, today in the next half hour should be construed as an invitation to trade or trading advice you know levels to buy or sell or what have you what I'm going to try and do is cover the key levels, what the risk management, what the best, what best risk management rules sh you should be applying with respect to your trading, and hopefully try and formulate a direction for um, the number, for, 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 formulate a direction for the market in the context of the overall numbers. So we'll get that out of the way, and then we can get started. So basically non-farm payrolls, obviously one of the keynote announcements of any given month. Um, last month, if you cast your mind back, we had a very disappointing number of 103,000, um, which was in significant contrast to the February number, which was 313. However, I think it's not really about the numbers, the payroll numbers anymore. And the reason for that is obviously unemployment is at 4.1%. It's at a significantly low level. And when the, when the labor market starts to get tight, um, the headline jobs numbers are less important than the actual, actual pace of wages growth. Um, you know, if, the, if, the, if the labor market is starting to get tight, then hopefully, um, and labor is getting scarce, then you would expect wages to go up. And that's something that I think has been significantly lacking over the course of the past few weeks and months. Um, US wages went as high as 2.9% a couple of months ago. Since then, they have drifted back to around about 2.7%. And we don't really expect that to significantly improve, despite the fact that even though the headline number, yes, um, last month was 103,000, the actual performance of the dollar since then, as can be seen by this dollar index chart, has been positive. So the headline number um, really didn't affect the direction of the dollar over the course of the last month or so. And that's, that to me suggests that ultimately the, the headline number is less important than perceptions about inflation, perceptions about wages growth. And that's why we've seen the breakout from these highs that we saw earlier this year. Now, those of you who've attended previous webinars will know that I highlighted this area through here, around about 91 as a key breakout level for the dollar index. It also coincided with the 120.150 level on euro dollar. Obviously, that is now back in the rearview mirror, as is the 91 level on the dollar index. Now, what's particularly interesting about this particular chart here is this candle here. We've seen a little bit of a reversal in the dollar at these particular levels. And does that suggest to me that the gains we've seen over the course of the past few sessions, we could be susceptible to a little bit of profit taking? Well, I would argue on the balance of probability that is quite likely. But ultimately, I think a lot will depend on the headline number. And there's more than that at risk today as well because what we've seen over the course of the past few weeks is a significant advance in European equity markets. European equity markets um, look as if they're going to close higher for the sixth successive week in a row. Now a large part of that is the fact that obviously they are undervalued relative to US markets which are fairly richly valued. The earnings numbers so far this week have been very, very positive, and yet if you look at US markets, they have underperformed. So if I look at the S&P 500, I posted a chart earlier this week on the S&P 200-day moving average. As you can see from this chart here, we're right on the cusp of this particular support level. If we go back and scroll back, I'm using the new HTML, HTML5 platform here. So please feel free to, to try it out. Um, the URL is platform.cmcmarkets.com. Um, it's running in parallel with the existing um, Flex platform. 
I think you'll find it's much more responsive, um, certainly in terms of the charting package. So if we look at the 200 day moving average on the S&P, we can see that around about this 2580 area is very, very important. We did try and break below it yesterday. We weren't able to sustain that break. We've actually only closed below the 200 day moving average on one occasion. We haven't been able to sustain the move. But I think what's particularly interesting about this chart is every time we've tested this moving average, each rebound has been shallower. Now that suggests to me that momentum is starting to taper off a little bit. And I think stronger dollar is part of that. Stronger dollar, if you look at US two year treasuries, they're yielding two and a half percent. Now, if you look at the S&P 500 and you look at the, the, the forward dividend yield for that, it's below two percent. So ultimately, if you hold U.S. stocks, yes, you might you might get you might get an occasional buyback from a company, so for example, like Apple, which I still think is fairly valued, unlike some other stocks in the tech sector. But relative to, say, for example, U.S. Treasuries, I would suggest that the differential between the two. US stocks and US treasuries in terms of return is fairly similar and that is starting to shift the balance of probabilities about further upside with respect to US stocks which contrasts obviously with what's going on in European markets where interest rates are still nailed to the floor and European markets um, have actually started to form a little bit of a base and have also broken back above the 200 day moving average, particularly the German DAX. Now, I don't expect a significantly aggressive move higher today in the DAX. I think we're in a new range. The top of that range is going to be the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of this entire up move, this down move here. We're above the 200 day moving average. So I think any dips in the DAX are likely to find decent support around about 12,645, 12,650 and is significant resistance above 12,800. So I think that's probably going to be the range of it for the time being. In the context, I think, of the direction of the dollar, we saw that little reversal candle in the dollar index. What I found particularly interesting was dollar yen. Now, we've been in an uptrend um, for quite some time. It's pretty much since the lows in March. But what we've seen here is we've got the 200 day moving average at just above 110, 110, 20, give or take. And those of you who've been following my chart forum updates on dollar yen, which you can access from here where it says forum, found some resistance at 110, key resistance 200 day moving average, trend line resistance behind that. That trend line resistance comes in from these peaks in November. So we can see that we're starting to run into a little bit of selling pressure on the dollar yen. Now, if we change that chart to a four hour chart, we can see from this chart here that around about 108.70, 108.80 is likely to be a decent area of support all the way through this level here. We could just, just below that, around about 108.70.80 generally tends to be support on dollar yen. So, so keep an eye on that in when, the, when these numbers come out later. In, a, in around about 10, 10 minutes time. Let's go to the calendar. So open the market calendar here. And we've got the non-farm payrolls number. So what are we expecting? Well, 192,000. It's in the average ballpark figure that we've seen thus far this year. Since January, we've seen numbers of 200, 313 and 103. So we're averaging 200,000 jobs a month. The ADP number has been showing similar sorts of um, jobs growth. So we know the US economy is doing okay. Um, we're getting a little a little bit of softer readings in terms of the headline numbers on the PMIs on the ISMs. But I think what is important is that the inflationary numbers, the prices paid numbers, are at seven year highs. So what we're seeing is that even though we're getting softening on the headline numbers, we are still seeing upward pressure being exerted on prices. And as we heard from the Fed meeting earlier this week, the Fed remains on course to hike rates next month. That's a given. I think it's going to happen. I can't see it not happening unless there's a, dis a significant drop off in the data. Let's not forget the Federal Reserve isn't the Bank of England. Okay, The Bank of England is much more unreliable than, shall we say, 
the Federal Reserve. Their forward guidance, to be quite honest, leaves an awful lot to be desired. So in the overall scheme of things with respect to non-farm payrolls, um, we're certainly looking for um, around about 192, but it's this number here that I'm really interested in, and it's this number here, so the wages number. So I'm going to be keeping a close eye on that one. Also going to be bringing this non-farm payrolls number up here. I'm just drawing that and popping that into the corner there. So those are the important numbers. The unemployment rate, we're expecting that to drop to 4%. But we also need to put that in the context of what the participation rate is doing. And again, at these sorts of levels, the unemployment rate is, again, less important than this number here. So I got asked a question just before I came on air, and it's a very good one, um, about the cable. And I talked about the break of 137.10 um, in various updates, either on Periscope this week or in the chart forums. And we can see that here. This 137.10 level was really, really important in the overall scheme of things with respect to the breakout because what it's done is it's completed a potential double top in cable. Now, we are approaching a very, very key support level here. So how we react around about 135.10, 135.20 will dictate how quickly we break lower towards my overall target. And I still think the pound will go lower in the longer term, I just think at the moment it's going to struggle to really push significantly below 135.20. And that for me is a really, really big level. And even if we do, we could find support around about 134.80. So longer term, I still think we're going to get a weaker pound on the back of a stronger dollar. I'm just unconvinced that we're going to get it today. But again, that will depend overall on how positive the wages numbers are. I can't help feeling that we could actually see a slightly dollar negative number. Again, it's just a hunch on my part. It's not based on anything more than my intuition with respect to the price action or the price pattern in dollar yen, which appears to be showing some form of evening star formation and evening star candlestick reversal. And the fact that we're on a very, very key support level on cable. If we also look at euro dollar, ladies and gentlemen, we can also see that even though we're below the 200 day moving average, I talked about this double top breakout and the fact that we're probably going to see a move to 117.80. We do have interim support 119.30. So again, here 119.30, a very, very big support level. If we have a very solid dollar number, we could get a, re a retest of these lows. The big question is, given how far we've come this week, is there enough dollar fuel in the tank to push us through that level? Looking at the four hour chart, looking at the daily chart, both look a little bit oversold. There is a little bit of sideways consolidation taking place through here. I could end up with egg on my face, but as I say, part of the, one of the reasons about being a trader is you take a calculated decision based on the levels and the chart points available to you. And at the moment, the 119.30 level is a very, very key support level which means that if you're going to play it from the long side for a rebound, your stop loss needs to be below that support level. So if you're long a euro dollar, you have to be, you know, your stop loss has to be below this support level here. If you're long a cable, your stop loss has to be below 135 or there or thereabouts um, if you're looking for a rebound. And if you're prepared to run 40 or 50 points, then you need to be making at least um, double that in terms of your take profit. One of the most neglected parts of trading is people think so much about their stop loss they give very very little thought to their take profit so the question i was asked with respect to cable was is it likely that we'll get a retest of 137 does it happen very often sometimes it does sometimes you get a bit of a pullback it doesn't always happen that way at the moment the way that the cable is positioned i would suggest that an awful lot of people are very pessimistic on it and we could get a rebound back to this level here would I put money on it at the moment? Maybe a small amount of money, but with a stop loss below 135. But as I say, um, it really depends on the numbers. And the numbers are out right now. So I will be quiet and let us dissect the numbers.
I'm waiting. 164 on non-farm payrolls. 3.9 the unemployment rate, so that's much better than expected. And 2.6 the wage number. So the wages are disappointing. Um, so again, that's potentially a little bit dollar negative. Let's just get rid of that. Up there, unemployment rate drops to 3.9. So at the moment, the market, if I had to take a punt on this, I would suggest that we're going to get a weaker dollar on the back of this. And it's going to be very difficult to break those key support levels on the pound and on euro dollar. But at the moment, the price action is going to try and push either side of the range, try and find the weakest level. But 2.6% so of wage growth, they've revised the March number lower as well. The underemployment rate has also dropped from 8% to 7.8. So despite the fact that unemployment is falling, underemployment is falling, wages are not going up. And that is going to be disappointing, particularly for those who think that we're going to get four rate rises this year. I do not see how the Federal Reserve can make the case for four rate rises this year. Still think we'll see one in June, but four rate rises, one in September, one in December, I think it's very, very difficult. Um, in terms of how does this affect the S&P and the Dow, I think it's positive because I think it will weaken the US dollar. Um, and one of the reasons why the Dow and the S&P have been falling has been because of a stronger dollar. Stronger dollar has been pushing down on the S&P and the Dow. Um, and what you may quite justifiably ask me, why is that? And essentially the reason for that is because a weaker dollar means that overseas earnings, you don't get as much a bite taken out of them. One of the reasons that the dollar has been strengthening is obviously expectations of higher interest rates from the US Federal Reserve. But if the dollar goes up, S&P 500 overseas earnings become that much less um, lucrative, shall we say. One of the reasons why I think we saw European markets underperform and have underperformed over the past 12 to 18 months is because of the rise in the euro from 105 to 125. It's sapped the um, German exporter's ability to generate significant profits. If you have a weaker currency, your overseas earnings basically contribute much more to your bottom line than if your currency is strong, particularly if you do an awful lot of overseas business in dollars, sterling, and what have you. So I think this number, more than anything, would, I think, mean that it's unlikely that US markets, even though they're going to probably finish lower for the week, I would be surprised if we close below the 200-day moving average today. But with US markets and the volatility that we've seen this week, it would be a very, very brave man to really put their hat on that. Um, but I think it, on the balance of probabilities, I would be surprised if US markets um, close below their 200-day moving averages today. Why? Because obviously we've also got a public holiday um, over the weekend, not necessarily in the US, but certainly in the UK we've got a long weekend. And certainly I think when markets return on Monday, liquidity is not going to be anywhere near as um, significant as it would be if London were in, and London is not in. So I think for the moment, I think we'll probably find a little bit of a retest of these lows around about 26.14, 26.15, but I don't anticipate, I think, um, a retest of the lows that we saw yesterday. I say it really depends on when the US, when US investors come in and uh, actually dissect the numbers, but from my interpretation of the numbers, those weak wages numbers would appear to suggest that um, if you're a dollar bull, they are disappointing. And certainly, I think if you look at the two-year, if you look at the U.S. two-year Treasury, that is slipping lower. It's 246.43. It's down one basis point on the day. If we look at it, say for example, over the day, that's the initial reaction. The yields have dropped. Um, lower yields generally tend to equate to a weaker dollar and also obviously tie into the fact that dollar yen is probably likely to test the downside. If dollar yen tests the downside, then the likelihood is that we will see a move higher in euro dollar and, and cable. These numbers, you know, they are disappointing. They're not the end of the world. 
but I certainly think on the basis of how the market has behaved this week, ladies and gentlemen, and I think that we could well see a little bit of dollar weakness as we head into the weekend. Euro dollar look to retest its 200 day moving average above 120 and the pound potentially head back above 136 towards around about 136.20, 136.30. There's nothing in these numbers to justify a stronger dollar in the short term. Doesn't mean that we won't get one in the longer term, but I think overall a minor dollar negative on these numbers. Um, being asked about euro dollar, move higher euro dollar, what should one watch as an upside limit? We've talked about this um, a little bit in the preamble. We've got the 200 day moving average. The highs of the last two days are going to be particularly important. So I think in the context of the upside, I will be looking at 120.20, 120.30 in the, in the short term, this area here. Why? Because it's basically the highs of the last two days. If we drill down into it, into an hourly chart like so, we can see that through here. We've had a number of attempts to get back above it. We haven't as yet been able to. But certainly on the basis of this particular hourly chart here and the four hourly chart here, we're starting to trend higher. We could well see a retest of this trend line here. If I draw that in there, just from that high there, all the way through, through those peaks through there. If we break through 120.20, we could go for a little run to the top side on what I would call a little bit of a short squeeze. One of the good things about um, the new HDMI 5 platform is something called Favorites. And that's this, this, that's this um, tab here. These are the things that I use the most. So rather than going into each tab and basically selecting the one that I want on a regular basis, all I need to do is go to Fibonacci, hit the star button there, and what it then does is it then gets displayed in the Draw Tools function there. So just go there. Fibonacci, there it is, yellow star, it's on, goes into favorites, and there it is, it's right there. There. So I've got in my favorites, I've got trend line, I've got support and resistance line, I've got Fibonacci retracements, I've got Fibonacci price extensions, which allows me to make a measured move projection of a, a typical breakout. I've got my standard moving average, I have my MACD, and I have my slow stochastic. So I'll just turn that off. Um, just being asked about, um, I'm just being asked about U.S. equity markets hitting new all-time highs. Do I see them hitting new all-time highs? Honestly, no, I don't. I think we've seen the highs for this year in U.S. equity markets. Um, the only way I would revise that view is if we break above this trend line resistance here. At the moment, the momentum appears to be towards the downside. So for me, I think if you base, if you're basing your analysis on a stronger dollar and the dollar continuing to strengthen, then I think that's going to be a headwind for U.S. markets. So if we do get a rebound in U.S. markets, I would be looking to sell into that with a stop loss above this trend line here. I think we've seen the best bits for U.S. markets for the time being, particularly if you if you buy into um, you know multiple Fed rate rises this year. I, I, I can't see I can't see the rationale behind new record highs for U.S. markets this year. Um, slightly different view on European markets. There's a slightly more of a tailwind for them, but that's usually that's I think that's a currency factor as well. I think the expectation has been this year that central banks are going to look to tighten policy. I think that's starting to come off the boil a bit with respect to the Bank of England and the European Central Bank. Um, those inflation numbers that we saw earlier this week out from Europe, not to put too fine a point on it, they were rubbish. Okay, the core numbers, 0.7%, they're just off the lowest levels in the last 10 years. So for me, I think with respect to um, the, with, with respect to um, what your perceptions are and what the ECB may do, I think they're going to find it very, very difficult to taper um, their bond buying program if the core CPI for the European Union doesn't start heading back above 1%. It's at 0.7%. It's only been lower um, at 0.6% back in 2008. Um, with respect to WTI, um, this is a slightly different story. Again, on WTI, the momentum 
favours the upside. And the only way I would revise my view that we're going to see higher oil prices is if we break back below this level here. It's around about $66.75, $66.80. So if we zoom that out, and you can see why this number is important. And this is my trusty Fibonacci retracement levels again. Let's go to the weekly chart. It's probably easier. So this is the 2014 highs down to the lows that we saw in 2016. We've retraced 50% of that. We're now above 50% of that. And if we go all the way back and really zoom this chart out, let me just get rid of these, these here. If we get these here, here we go. We can see that between 50% and 61.8, there's virtually nothing. There's sort of what I would call there's a fresh air, there's a vacuum. In that weekly candle here, we dropped pretty much $12 in the space of a week. The same thing applies to Brent crude. We've just got a fresh air dump between this level here and this level here. So now that we've gained a foothold above $66.80, on WTI, I think the bias has to be buy the dip in crude oil until such times as we move back below this level here. So at the moment we're trading in a little bit of a corridor, solid support around about $66.80, some decent resistance through here, but ultimately I think that the bias for me is a test of $76 a barrel on WTI and $80 a barrel on Brent crude. It's a similar sort of chart here. If we just click on that, and again, we can see it's a sim the chart looks fairly similar. If we do the long-term view, again, we've also seen the two moving averages cross over, which is fairly positive. So oil prices aren't going to come crashing off anytime soon, even though the 200-day moving average is still falling. The 50-day moving average is pointing higher. And we can see here, again, um, we've broken above this 50% level on Brent crude which is at $71.65. We've continued to maintain the foothold above that key support key support level and until such times as the market is able to break below it I think it's going to be very difficult to make the argument that oil can go in any, any way but higher. That's not to say that we can't come back lower eventually but the bias I think with respect to being at current levels is we could slip back down towards here, but as, while this level here continues to support the oil price, then you're likely to get rebounds off that and a retest of $80 a barrel. And let's not forget also that how far we've come since June of last year. If we look at how far oil prices have come since June last year, we can see that um, we've seen a significant, significant move higher on on the oil price and um, we're, we're quite a bit higher certainly in the context of this particular move um, we're around about 50 odd percent above where we were this time June last year so you can't say that's not going to have an inflationary effect and that's the wrong type of inflation and I think that's why I think you're finding that consumer spending is as constrained as it is you've seen it in the US You've seen it in the UK and we've seen it this morning in European Union in terms of retail sales. They were very disappointing. So on WTI, I'm still of, I'm still of the opinion that while we're above, and Brent, while we're above this line over here, crude oil prices, I would be looking to buy any dips back to this line. If we break below that line, then I would revise that opinion. And it's essentially that's what trading is all about. You trade around the levels. Um, and then you formulate an opinion on the basis of those levels and the price action around those levels. At the moment, crude oil prices are in an uptrend, so you're looking potentially to, to buy the dips until such times as you've got evidence that that uptrend is starting to show signs of tapering off. And at the moment, we're not really, we're not really seeing any evidence of that. If we look at gold prices, um, just to finish up, Again, we found decent support the 200-day moving average, um, and the oscillator is starting to um, turn a little bit higher. So again, 
you can look at the support and resistance levels. It's fairly basic stuff. This and this is why I like to try and keep you know my trading simple. You look at the levels. You then base your risk management style on either the levels holding with your stop loss below it and your take profit at least twice the amount of what you're looking to risk on the downside. Okay, so it's 13.45, ladies and gentlemen. Does anyone else have any questions? Do they want me to cover a market that I haven't already covered? I mean, hopefully um, that's given you some food for thought with respect to the overall direction of the markets. Um, because uh, unless anyone has any other questions, um, I will um, I'll wind this up and um, I wish you all a very good and enjoyable long bank holiday weekend.